Father, thank you for the blessing of being adopted into your family, for being children who have nothing left to prove, nothing to earn, um, no need to make ourselves worthy of something we could never be worthy of. Lord, we thank you that you have chosen us and saved us and forgiven and justified us because of grace. And I pray that as we continue to think about this incredible truth of the Trinity, that you would help us to do this well with our minds fully engaged and, and the Spirit obviously working in our hearts and minds as we continue to ponder this wonderful truth. So we come to you grateful and eagerly expectant for you to work. And we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we continue to talk about the Trinity. Last time we talked about the four essential affirmations of biblical Trinitarianism. What's the first one? Don't look and read, think. First affirmation of biblical Trinitarianism. There's one and only one true and living God. Good. Second. What's the second affirmation? Okay, this one God has eternally existed is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes? It's, it'd be good to me actually memorize these four affirmations. The third one is what? It starts to unpack the first two. What's the third affirmation? Uh, okay, they all have the same divine essence. Good, that's a good way to put it. That Father, Son, and Spirit equally possess the same divine nature or essence works too. So, uh, we now have a fourth. What's fourth affirmation? They are distinct in the way that they relate to each other and to humanity and creation. Okay, good. So, they're distinct fundamentally in relationship and role. The way they accomplish things, the way they function. So, relationship and function is the primary way we see the distinctions in the person of the Trinity. Good. Last time we laid the basis for solid monotheism. Now let's continue to think about biblical Trinitarianism. It's important to realize that the New Testament is the place where the Trinity explodes, where we see this wonderful unfolding of the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not so present explicitly in the Old Testament. This troubles some people because we say, well, why would there be this, this awaiting of this beautiful unfolding of the Trinity until the New Testament? Well, it makes sense if you think about the fourth affirmation, doesn't it? How do we see the Trinity primarily? How do we primarily see the distinctions in the persons of the Trinity? How do we see it? We just said it. In the way they, re they relate. Good. In the way they relate and the roles, the way they accomplish things together. So what happens in the New Testament? The purposes of redemption are put in a fourth gear. That's if you only have four, it's not, or fifth if you need that. So it's, it's put in high gear. And so God is now revealing himself and working together among the persons of the Trinity in redemptive purposes and sending the Son and redeeming humanity. And so as his work intensifies, so does the revelation of who he is in the Trinity. And so we recognize the full-blown teaching of the Trinity in the New Testament. But that doesn't mean there aren't, aren't hints in the Old Testament that something like that is going on all the time. Let's look at some of these hints. As we look at the Old Testament picture we get of the Trinity, B.B. Warfield's words are so helpful. See what he says in the bottom of 35? The Old Testament may be likened to a chamber, a room, richly furnished but dimly lighted. The introduction of light brings into it nothing which was not in it before. But it brings out into clearer view much of what is in it, but was only dimly or even not at all perceived before. The mystery of the Trinity is not revealed in the Old Testament, but the mystery of the Trinity underlies the Old Testament revelation. And here and there almost comes into view. 
Thus, the Old Testament revelation of God is not corrected by fuller revelation that follows it, but only perfected, extended, and enlarged. Do you get that? you get that way the Old Testament plays into our understanding of the Trinity? So there are things in the Old Testament that once you understand the Trinity, you look back and you say, oh yeah, that's how you understand that. That's how that can make sense. Well, like what? Well, we don't want to camp too much and put too much emphasis on these things because the Bible doesn't explicitly explain them. But there are so many things in the Old Testament that if you don't have the Trinity make you say, huh, what's going on here? Like, for instance, Elohim. The name for God is plural in form. Interesting. What else? Other plural forms. Like in Genesis 1.26, then God said, let us make man in our image. Genesis 3, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Genesis 11.7, come let us go down and confuse their languages. And Isaiah 6.8, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? What is going on here with this plural usage in God's self-referencing? Well, some people say, well, it must be the royal we. You know how Queen Elizabeth will talk. We are not amused, right? She'll, she'll refer to herself in the plural like that. That's the royal we going on there. It's, it's not meaning anything about a plurality in God. Well, the problem with that is, is there is zero evidence in all of Hebrew literature that that's what's going on. We just don't have this idea of the royal we. There, there, there seems to be something else going on, some sort of plurality in God himself. What about the image of God itself? This is fascinating. Watch this in Genesis 1.27. Remember we said Elohim, God, is plural, plural in form. So, so God, plural noun, and you know in Hebrew, uh, verbs agree with the noun uh, in number. So singular and plural are, are, are in agreement, but not here. You have come, so God, plural form Elohim, created, singular verb, man, singular noun, Adam, in his own image, singular pronoun. In the image of God, plural noun, he, singular pronoun, created, singular verb, him, singular pronoun. Male and female, he created them. <gasps> So right in humanity, made in the image of God, you've got a singularity and a plurality. We make humans in his image and there is a, a unified oneness in human nature, but intentionally, right off the bat, distinction in being made male and female. How about the angel of the Lord? Also makes you say, huh, what's going on here? Well, the angel of the Lord shows up several times in the Old Testament, and he's this figure who comes representing God. He's the angel of the Lord. Like in Genesis, uh, where he appears to Abraham and, and Hagar. In Exodus at the burning bush, we didn't pay attention to it at the time, but do you know that narrative where God meets a Moses at the burning bush? It begins by saying the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a burning bush. So this messenger, this revealer of God, and this speaker of God's truth is distinct from God as the angel, the messenger of Yahweh. But then once the narrative picks up, it's as if there's no difference between the two. The angel Lord speaks as the Lord. This happens with Gideon, as I have for you here in Judges 2. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, notice the angel of the Lord is saying this, but he's taking the very voice of God. I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall break down the altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So God is speaking here through the agent of the angel of the Lord, but there seems to be no difference, essentially. How do you explain this apart from some sort of plurality in God that's getting you ready for the Trinity? How about passages where there are two distinct persons who are both called God or Lord? Like Psalm 45. Your throne, O God, speaking to the Messiah, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. 
still speaking to the Messiah, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God will set you above your companions. This is bewildering. If there's not something about a plurality going on in God. Well, actually, the writer of the Hebrews quotes this passage, Psalm 45, and says that this God who is set above his companions by God is Jesus. Jesus himself quotes Psalm 110 in reference to himself that says, speaking of David, the Lord says to my Lord, David says, huh? King David, the prototypical messianic king, has a Lord? Yeah, it, it's one of his, his offspring, the Messiah. So the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Similar idea going on here that was in Psalm 45. And Jesus in Matthew 22 says that this Lord of David, he says, does David have two lords? How could that be? Your, your, your offspring does not become your Lord. Well, in the case of Christ, it does. So we have two lords here. Like we have two gods in Psalm 45. Other passages make you say, what in the world? If you don't have something like the Trinity going on. Genesis 1, 2, the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I thought God created. He did. Well, who's the Spirit of God? Proverbs 30 asks a fascinating question. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Obviously, God is who we're talking about here. Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. Well, they didn't know the name of the Son of God, but we do. His name is Jesus Christ. Listen to this Trinitarian combination in 42.1 of Isaiah. <coughs> Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. So you see, God is speaking here, and he speaks of his servant, the Messiah. And what does he say about him? I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So we have God speaking about his servant who accomplishes his purpose, and he does it in the power of the spirit. Preparing us for Jesus' baptism. When he comes up out of the water and the dove descends and the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Another way of saying my soul delights in him. And he's going to bring forth justice to the nations. So the Old Testament does prepare us for the Trinity. It doesn't explicitly teach it. That awaits the New Testament. But it teaches it enough, I think, so that when Abraham got to heaven and realized the full-blown understanding of the Trinity, he probably said something like, I knew something like that was going on, even though he didn't have all the details of it. Uh, so... So we're prepared by the Old Testament. Questions about these Old Testament uh, portrayals of a plurality in God that get you ready, Ryan? Um, using just yeah, there, there are efforts to, to explain it without going to some sort of plurality in God, like some literary usage that's merely um, something like the royal we. There are efforts. I haven't had heard really good explanations for these things. Honestly, they get ignored a lot. Um, same is true of some messianic passages in the Old Testament that so clearly point to Jesus. Um, I mean, there, there have been efforts to explain these apart from some sort of plurality in God, but, but not compelling arguments that I've heard. Um, they're, they're really tricky. I think you have to say, I don't know what's going on. Which is, I think, where we would be left, too, if, if we didn't get to the New Testament and say, oh, that's what's going on. Now, let's not camp too much here because it's not like the New Testament then, then says, and you know how when Elohim was used, well, that's, that's getting you ready for the Trinity. It doesn't quite go there. 
But I think we are able to look back at it and say, oh sure, we can understand these things in light of the Trinity. They're not explicitly explained for us in that way. So we don't want to say the, the Trinity's taught explicitly in the Old Testament. We just want to say, boy, I don't know how you understand these things without being able to look back in, on them with, with an understanding of the Trinity like we have. Or something at least like the Trinity, right? Okay. In Proverbs 34, when it says, when should you know? Yeah. Did God kind of expect them? Or that they no. I, um, I think that's sarcasm. You don't know. You don't know. You, you're presuming too much of yourself. It's, I think it's Job-like language. The way God speaks to Job. Okay, anything else about this OT picture? Yeah, again, we don't have really clear explanations of who this is and what's going on here. Like we don't for Melchizedek. Melchizedek shows up. He has no genealogy. He's got a perpetual priesthood. And he basically has the Lord's Supper with Abraham. Who is that? And it's almost like we're going to get an explanation of it in, in Hebrews. And that's when he says, oh, about this we have much to say, but we can't because you're slow of hearing. And then he goes on about needing to, to continue on in the truth. It's almost like we're about to get Melchizedek unpacked for us to the point where we may come to a fuller understanding. Or this, this man walking around with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace that is somehow responsible for their not being burned up. Who's that? Many have thought, well, that sure sounds like the kind of role that Jesus plays in representing and revealing and, and, and saving even. And so, so it's speculative, but boy, is there reason to think we're seeing something of even the son's role being played out in this angel of the Lord and maybe even some of these other figures. But again, we're saying maybe. We don't want to camp on it too much. Okay. Now, once we get to the New Testament, we get this clear picture that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are fully and completely God in and of themselves, and they are distinct persons. The, the deity and personhood of the Father is never really a debate. The deity of the Son most certainly is. And we will camp on that issue the whole third of, last third of the semester. We will dive into the deity of the Son and the, the personhood of the Son and, and, find, and really understanding better who He is. So for now, let's assume the Father and the Son's deity and personhood, yes? Assume that, set it aside, and now think about the personhood and deity of the Spirit. That's what we need to focus on right now. So first, let's think about the personhood of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a personal being. He is not a force. He's not an oblong blur. He's not uh, something from Star Wars that you get in touch with so you can fly your spaceship. You, you uh, have to think about the Spirit as a person, a distinct person, not a vague emanation of the power of God. Now, why do I say this? Well, because of the way I'm talking about him, because that's the way the Bible talks about him. It calls him he. Personal pronouns are used to describe the Holy Spirit. John 14, 6 is an example. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things. John 15, 26. When the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness about me. Now, please realize that uh, Greek is a gendered language. You've all studied gendered languages like French or Spanish or German. English isn't gendered in that way. And you know that the, the gender of a noun agrees with the pronoun in gender, right? So uh, in, in English, when you're working this way, a masculine noun gets what pronoun? He, right? And feminine gets she. And a neuter noun, a neuter noun, um, Gets, gets what pronoun? It. Good. Realize that the word for spirit, pneuma, uh, spirit, is a neuter noun. 
Yet the New Testament intentionally breaks the rules of Greek grammar and refers back to pneuma, not with it, but with he, with, with this noun translated he. It's a personal pronoun. To make a point. The Bible's saying we're breaking the rules of grammar here to make a point about this neuter noun to make sure you realize it's, it's a person and not a thing, not an it. It's important to learn to talk that way about the Spirit. He is a person. Personal activities are ascribed to the Holy Spirit. Think of how personal these activities of the Spirit are. Only persons do things like create. And we see the Spirit of God creates. He helps. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Who's the first helper that He replaces? Himself. Who's Himself? Jesus. Jesus, yes. Look, to, to take Jesus' place in helping his people, you can't be a thing. You can't be an it. Think of the way Jesus comforts. And he says, I'm sending another comforter, another parakletos to come alongside and help you and comfort you. Things don't comfort like that. You may be sitting there thinking, well, I find ice cream rather comforting. No, we're talking about something incredibly personal here. Comfort food is one thing, but the kind of comfort Jesus gives as, as the helper is very personal, and that's how he helps. The Spirit helps like Jesus helps. He teaches. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Only persons teach. He teaches us truths. He bears witness and testifies. When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, He will testify about Me. That's very personal. And the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. He glorifies Christ. This is His central role, which is one of the reasons we can wrongly neglect Him. Because when He's doing His job, Jesus is getting the focus. But... Only a person can do this. The spirit of truth will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Oh, well, listen to this precious truth in Romans 8. He intercedes for us. He prays for us on behalf of others. In the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Can you relate to that? Guys, I don't know if there's any, I don't think there's any part of my life as a Christian that is more of a struggle than prayer. Prayer is so hard for me. And I'm so often thankful that no one's recording my prayers and playing them for other people besides God. Imagine if your prayers this morning were recorded and then played in chapel. If you did that to me, I'd be so embarrassed because they're often incoherent and rambling and, and it seems so ineffective and unthoughtful. And, and a lot of the time, I don't even know what to pray. I have all these desires in my heart and I'm not even sure how to put them into words. I have people I've prayed for for decades and I just I don't even know what to pray anymore besides... Lord, please save them. I don't know what they really need in the details of that, but would you just save them? Would you save them from themselves? Sometimes I just, my prayer is, ah. And listen to what the Spirit does in His kind ministry for us. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. He comes alongside in this comforting role with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with God's will. He comes alongside my bumbling, fumbling, incoherent, rambling, distracted, uh, uncertain prayers. And he, he says, I got it. 
and he takes them before the throne and, and translates them and makes them intelligible and, and according to the will of God. It's just a beautiful ministry he plays in our lives. He's so kind to us. I'm so thankful for that. Now I ask you, can a thing do that? Can an it do that? Can an impersonal force do that? No, this Holy Spirit must be a person. He, on the top of 38, searches the deep things of God. He knows the thoughts of God. Listen to this. He decides when and how and to whom he will distribute spiritual gifts. Persons do that. First Corinthians 12. All these spiritual gifts are the work of one and the same spirit. And he gives them to each one just as he determines. That's a person doing that. This is wild. He forbids certain activities. He, he doesn't allow his apostles to go preach in some places in Acts 16. Two times he prevents them from going and doing what they assume God would want. He's guiding and directing them. He speaks. Look at Acts 8.29. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And that leads to that wonderful evangelistic encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. And we got our first African come to Christ. And tradition says he goes back to Africa and becomes a pioneer missionary there. And he's a eunuch, the, the kind of people who don't get to be part of the people of God. And he becomes part of the people of God. Beautiful picture. And how did all that come about? Well, the Spirit told Philip to go do it. The Spirit speaks. He, he gives direction. Acts 13, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and, Sp and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Very specific calling and speaking. Only persons do that. He evaluates and approves a wise course of action. This is amazing. Uh, you know, they've got this big controversy in the church of Jerusalem. And what do they say? Acts 15, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Hey, what a great way to make decisions in the church, huh? Do you know that after the day of, the Pente of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes in new covenant power, we never have the casting of lots again? We never have these external ways of discerning the will of God. It now becomes this internal Holy Spirit discernment that he brings to the people of God as they gather around his word and seek his leading and have these difficult discussions where they seek the will of God. What a great way to make decisions. Way better than we often do it, huh? Like we took a vote and the resolution passed by a two-thirds majority. Or, the, Holy, uh, or the, the senior pastor said so. So that's what we're doing. Doesn't mean you can't use those kinds of things, I guess. But we sort of camp on that much less messy process. But there's this more lengthy, messy process of following the Holy Spirit's work. But he approves course of action as a person. And think about this. You have to be a person to be grieved, don't you? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit has an emotional life. He can be grieved and he can take delight in our faithfulness as well as grieve over our sin. Do you get the point? The Holy Spirit's a person. He's not a thing. He's not an it. He's not a force. He's a person to be understood to as and related to as a personal being. Good. Got the person of God. Questions? Comments? Marie? Sure, I mean. Great question. That's how good theologians think. They, they say, we're getting this wonderful teaching on the Trinity. We're understanding what the Bible teaches. Now, what does this mean for my prayer life? That's how we need to be thinking. And it means a ton for your prayer life. And the more you understand the Trinity, the more your prayer life will be enriched and your worship will be enriched and your ministry will be enriched and walking with Jesus. It, because the Trinity is the core of who God is and it's, it's therefore the backdrop of everything else that's happening, all that He does. Uh, and so, you look at the Bible and you look at prayer in light of the Trinity and you realize there's this general understanding of prayer as something we do to the Father, but only 
through the Son and only in the power of the Spirit. And so the direction of my prayer is to the Father, but I realize I never do that apart from the Son getting me there through His life and work and person and the Spirit's empowering and enabling both in that work He did and in my heart enabling me to pray and inclining me to pray at all. And so with an awareness of the three persons of the Trinity functioning in my prayer life, even though the direction is generally to the Father, I never do that independent of the Son. Um, and so prayer is fundamentally a God-willed, Son-accomplished, Spirit-enabled reality. And when we realize that, it takes on a richness and a vibrance and a reality that it needs to have with a Trinitarian backdrop. But that's true for worship. That's true for ministry. That's true for relating to God in general. Make sense? Um, you've all gotten this better than you realize. I know it's always disturbing to my students because we pay so little attention to the Trinity. And it's not this thing that's explicit and out front. It's this thing that's so background and backdrop and so foundational that we miss it a lot in explicit ways. But you, you can't be a Christian unless you at least have a tacit understanding of the Trinity. You know what I mean by tacit? You know what I mean? Anybody know what I mean by tacit? Well, sure, unspoken, but there's a reason it's unspoken. Uh, it's understood, but not explicitly, not, maybe not even consciously. It's sort of back here. Uh, I, I have it well enough to understand things, but it's, it hasn't moved to my RAM or my, to an explicit conscious understanding. So tacit knowledge. Um, By the way, let me highly recommend a book. The Deep Things of God, subtitles How the Trinity Changes Everything by Fred Sanders. Uh, he, he has a great opening section where he talks about tacit knowledge because Christians often come to the Trinity and they say, well, you know, here I am, 40 years old. I've never really thought about this stuff, but I've been going to heaven all along. I'm a true believer. And so uh, what does it mean for me to really think the Trinity is important? Do I really need to understand all this stuff? Can I get into heaven without it? Well, yes and no. Uh, yes in that it doesn't need to be explicit, even fully conscious knowledge, but it needs to be back there enough for you to be able to uh, get the gospel. So tacit knowledge is knowledge you have that you might not even realize you have. Like Fred uses in this book, a great illustration of when he was a little kid. And he was outside on a full moonlit night looking at these clouds go by the moon. And now they, they took on this, this beautiful uh, appearance as they went by the moon. And he's out there just staring at the moon and these clouds. And his uncle comes out and says, Fred, what are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm watching the clouds go in front of the moon. And uh, he says, it's just beautiful. And he said, you've been out here a long time. He says, yeah. I've been out here trying, uh, wait, well, I'm waiting until one goes behind the moon. <laughs> his, uncle, his uncle says, oh, okay. And he says, hey, Fred. Yeah? Where's the moon? It's in outer space. Where are the clouds? They're in our atmosphere. Oh. <laughs> I would have been out here a long time, huh? <laughs> now, Fred knew everything he needed to know to make that conclusion, right? He didn't get any new information. The information just moved to the front and led him to a conclusion he needed to get to, but not by providing new information. 
And the Trinity can be the same way. We've got the Trinity back there, but until you're forced to think about it, often you don't realize it. So, what do I mean by that? You don't have the gospel if you don't have the Trinity. What do I mean by that? Well, are you a Christian? Yeah. Why? My sins are forgiven. How'd that happen? Well, Jesus died for him. And who did he have to be for that to be? It had to be God and man. And how did that happen? Well, the Father sent him. And then how did that come about? Oh, the Holy Spirit brought about a virgin conception and then enabled Jesus to do all the things he did in his ministry. And how did you come to realize this? Well, the Holy Spirit taught this to me deep down. And, and how do you know this is true of you? Well, he the Holy Spirit testifies in my spirit that, that I'm a child of God. And so you realize that you got to have the Trinity working <laughs> or you don't have what we have. It's no coincidence, guys, that groups that deny the Trinity lose salvation as a free gift of God. Do you think that the lack of Trinitarian understanding and Mormon works salvation are disconnected? Or Jehovah's Witnesses' lack of a Trinitarian understanding of God isn't clearly connected to the fact that they have to work for their salvation? No, the free grace of the gospel is the, the product of the Trinitarian working that gives us the gospel. And so even if it's tacit knowledge, it's knowledge you have. What we're doing now is just moving it to the front and helping you see how it is what enables all the things uh, that have been accomplished to be accomplished. Yes? Okay. The deity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He's not just a person. He's God. Hebrews 9, 14. He is eternal. He's called the eternal spirit. He's omnipresent. The psalmist rhetorically asks, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? Heaven, earth, no matter where I go, you're there. The spirit is everywhere present with his whole being. He's all-knowing. He knows the thoughts of God alone. He's all-powerful. He brings about this thing that's impossible with man, like the virgin conception. He's holy, as God is holy. After all, he's the Holy Spirit. And look at these passages that attribute the same activity to the Holy Spirit and to God. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then what do we find out at the end of this passage? You have not lied to men, but to God. And finally, the words of Yahweh are the words of the Spirit. Acts 28, when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers. I thought it was God speaking through Isaiah the prophet. It was, but in the person of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who brings that prophetic word to Isaiah. So the Holy Spirit is both a person and divine. Questions or comments about the person of the Spirit? The deity of the Spirit. When you think Trinity, don't instinctively, reflexively rush to illustrations you come up with. That's such a temptation with incomprehensibilities, isn't it? Especially when you're teaching kids and they keep asking you hard questions. Hi. Um, <laughs> yes. And you say, oh, I don't understand the Trinity. And what do you do? You immediately want to say, oh, well, it's like an egg. <laughs> and I, I suppose we can get maybe a little shred of a glimmer of shell, yolk, white. Okay. It's like a cherry pie. You know, the Father's the crust, the Spirit's the filling, and Jesus is the cherries. All right, really? Is that where we have to go? Uh, even really good ones, like Augustine's, that the Father's the lover, the Son's the beloved, and the Spirit's love. Okay, let's not reflexively always rush to places like that. Let's go right to the Bible. 
when we want to think, how are we supposed to think about the Trinity? Well, think Matthew 3. Right here. Matthew 3. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That's way better than a cherry pie. <laughs> way better. Go there. Think about that. That's the biblical picture of the Trinity that needs to be coming to mind when you think about the Trinity. Look at Matthew 28. Baptizing them, this is a great commission, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name, notice singular name, not names, name, one name, one divine character of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then as you read through the New Testament, Start listening for Trinity music. There is a Trinitarian cadence in the New Testament. Think about good monotheistic Jews, nevertheless backing up and bringing in together in unity and distinction, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that there's actually a Trinitarian cadence. 2 Corinthians 13, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the Fa love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God who works in all of them and all men. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's over all and through all and in all. Is that cool? There's this Trinity music in the New Testament where distinction and unity keep being played out for us. John 1, 1 through 2, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And so we've got passage after passage that keeps bringing Father, Son, and Spirit into equality while all the while having distinct personhood. Lots of passages we could look at. Uh, one of the things Fred recommends in trying to get the Trinity better is to speed read the Gospel of John looking for the Trinity. And it's all over the place. It's, it's almost overwhelming how this intra-Trinitarian relations keep, keep working themselves out in the Gospel of John as God brings about his redeeming purposes. Look at John 14, halfway through page 41. Listen to this Trinitarian working. Remember we said one of the main ways we see the Trinity, uh, the two main ways is in the way they relate to one another and accomplish things together, the, the economic working of the Trinity, how he accomplishes things. Watch this. I will ask the Father, Jesus says. So the Son is talking about asking the Father. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, the Spirit, to be with you forever. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. See his Father, Son, and Spirit working together constantly. John 16, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. How will he do that? For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Do you see, he can't even get a statement out with wanting to make sure, without wanting to make sure he backs up and sees it in a Trinitarian perspective. John 20, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. You get these interworkings between Father, Son, and Spirit over and over again. So we, we've got Father, Son, and Spirit, equally divine in nature, distinct in personhood. Now there are two ways you can get the Trinity wrong. Um, you can on one end of the spectrum fall into thinking about the Trinity that is tritheism. where you don't have equal divine nature in Father, Son, and Spirit. They somehow end up making divine nature when you add them all together, but they don't have uh, equal divine natures in the Father, Son, and Spirit. And so it ends up being tritheism. This is what Muslims would say we are, tritheists. We have three different gods. We don't have three different gods. We have one God who exists 
as three persons. Tritheism is one way to have such sharp distinctions that you have separation, you have division, you have three gods. The other end of the spectrum, though, is what we call modalism or Sabellianism, as I have there in your notes for you, where the, the Trinity walks this tension between tritheism on one hand and modalism on the other hand. Modalism has, has a view of God as one God, but who acts in different ways at different times. So in creation, he's the father. He's acting as father, the king. In redemption, he's acting as the son. In uh, the church age, in the application of the work of the Son, he's acting as the Spirit. But it's one God just in different modalities, in different ways of manifesting himself. And actually, one of the illustrations people have used for the Trinity um, is very modalistic. You may have heard people say, uh, well, we can understand the Trinity in, in the sense that, see, Travis is one person, but he's also a son. You have siblings? Yeah. He's a brother and he is a student. That's just modalism if you're trying to talk about the Trinity that way. Because we just have one person who, yes, has different roles, different ways of acting, but he's just one person. There, there aren't three distinct persons, even though he has three distinct roles. And so modalism just sees the one God acting in different ways at different times, appearing in different ways at different times. You have no way of explaining, then, Jesus' baptism. You have no way of talking about uh, God the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Spirit descending on him as a dove, anointing him for public ministry. You have no ability to explain that or understand that. You don't have any ability to understand Jesus praying to the Father in the garden or saying, I'm going to go to the Father, I'm going to ask him to send the Spirit, and the Spirit's going to come. Modalism is inexplicable if you, if you want to take passages like that seriously. Uh, there are modern-day modalists. They, they're mostly in what we call oneness Pentecostalism. Uh, Pentecostalism is a, a denomination within the broad category of the charismatic denomination church who have thoroughgoing orthodox doctrine, uh, biblical doctrine, but there's a heretical sect within Pentecostalism called oneness Pentecostalism or Jesus-only Pentecostalism that are modalists um, and they deny the Trinity. Actually, one of the most, the well, most well-known one is Pentecostal probably is a man named T.D. Jakes. And T.D. Jakes is a charismatic, brilliant, gifted uh, leader of a big church in Texas, Potter's House, who's a well-published author and has had quite a bit of influence. And as a matter of fact, Time Magazine, I believe it was, put him on the cover as the next Billy Graham, the one who was going to step into Billy Graham's shoes when Billy Graham dies. The problem is, is he doesn't believe in the Trinity. And not many people seem to notice or care. Some certainly did. Right. Um, yeah, well, they'll, they'll say, I guess modalities can be sort of lumped together. God can act these three different ways, maybe at the same time. Yeah, it's really hard for it to be real or genuine in any way as, God's, as Jesus is crying out to the Father, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, do you realize how important it is that we have this inter-Trinitarian inter, inter dynamic for all the things God accomplishes to actually be accomplished? Like, it's no coincidence oneness Pentecostals are really legalistic. If you think about the way sanctification and salvation is thought of in oneness Pentecostalism, uh, it's very legalistic. Again, you disconnect from the, the Trinity, you disconnect from salvation actually being accomplished, and you have to start working for your salvation. Um, so it matters. Well, why does it matter? You go ahead. Uh, so how do you connect the um, legalism to the... We'll see in a second. Let, let's keep going, and I think that will become more clear. So what do we lose? What do we lose if we don't have the Trinity? Why is it so problematic that a man like T.D. Jakes doesn't hold to the Trinity? What do we lose if we lose the Trinity? Everything. Even if you haven't been fully conscious of of how much you lose. Even if you've been able to actually gain possession of something the Trinity has given you, realize that the Trinity has given this to you. Like revelation of God as we have it in Christ. 
The doctrine of the Trinity makes the revelation of God we have of God possible. John 1.18 gets right at it. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Revelation of God in the way we have it, that means definitive revelation and personal revelation and sufficient revelation and revelation that doesn't vaporize you when you take it in is something that's accomplished as the Father sends the Son and the Son in a spirit-enabled way becomes flesh and exegetes God for us, makes Him known. We lose revelation if we lose the Trinity. We lose redemption, and here we, we get to the point now that was just asked. We lose atonement. We lose redemption. We lose salvation if we don't have the Trinity accomplishing it for us. As all three persons of the Trinity accomplish the atonement. Hebrews 9.14 just nails this. Listen to this description of how we're saved. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. Do you see how the Trinity accomplishes this atoning work? Christ comes and becomes a man and bleeds and pays our penalty, offers our sacrifice, all enabled by the Spirit, starting with the virgin conception, and enabling him and filling him and leading him throughout his ministry. And how does that happen? He then offers himself unblemished to God. As he dies on a cross as the perfect sacrifice and says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And our sin is declared to be his sin and the wrath of God is poured out on him because of that. How can all of that happen in a Holy Spirit enabled way if we don't have the Trinity? It can happen. And even if someone's not conscious of the need for that Trinitarian atoning work to make it happen, if it's not there, you're going to invariably be led down the road of having to earn it yourself because it's a Trinitarian accomplishment. And if you don't have this basic gospel dynamic of the Son going according to the will of the Father and the Spirit enabling all that to happen, to fulfill the Father's will as the Son joyfully does that and the Spirit glorifies the Son who brings us to the Father. If you don't have all that going on, you don't have the gospel. And you end up working for it. You end up going door to door so you can be saved. Um, okay. Um, you know what I'm talking I'm not talking about the candy. I'm talking about the wrapper, right? Um, where was I? Yes. So, the, the, so what's the result? What's the result of this atoning work that is accomplished because of the Trinity? Our consciences are cleansed from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Look, do you realize that the first clause can't happen if you don't have the Trinity? You don't have this inter-Trinitarian dynamic working our salvation, and so then you don't have cleansed consciences from acts that lead to death or the ability to serve this living God. You may not have realized that the Trinity did this for you, but it did. And the more you realize how it happened, the more rich your understanding of the gospel will be, and your prayer life will be, and your worship will be, and your ministry will be, and your daily relating to God will be. The subtitle of this book, The Deep Things of God, is How the Trinity Changes Everything, even if you don't realize it does. So... Um, we lose redemption. We lose atonement and revelation. What else do we lose? Please listen very carefully. Very carefully. This is a hard point. It's a hard point in the class to bring this up because it's a hard point, but do what you need to to make up for the fact that you ate far too big a lunch and listen very carefully. Show you're not tired. You did 40 push-ups over there. You're ready to go. Your arms are a little sore, but you're ready to go. Yes, listen. Three is an important point. If we don't have the Trinity, then either his independent sufficiency or his relational and personal nature are lost. One of them has to go if we don't have at least something like the Trinity. You can't have a God who's self-sufficient and independent and eternally loving and relational 
if he's got no ability to love and relate. Yes? You got that? You got to give up one, of, one or the other. You've got to give up either self-sufficient independence or the ability to love and relate for all of eternity. God's a personal God. He's a loving God. He's a creative God. And he had no ability to express relationality, creativity, or love if we don't have something like the Trinity going on, right? How is God eternally loving before creation? If we don't have the Trinity, he actually needs creation to love. He needs creation to be creative. He needs creation to be relational. That's why God's in the conceptions that don't have the Trinity are these distant, static, cold gods. Or so with us, they're no different. But remember we said he's the great I am and the God of our fathers? And so we recognize that God is independent and self-sufficient and eternally, by nature, relational and creative and loving, yes? You get that point? It's really important. The, the Trinity enables God at his very core to be who he is. Remember we said right at the heart of the God of the Bible is the great I am and the God of your fathers, a profoundly eternal and infinite and independent God and an eternally relational and loving God. And that's always been true of him because of the Trinity. Otherwise, you can't have that. Go ahead, Marcel. Yeah, I think, I, I think that word person that we, we use means... A, a center of consciousness, a, a distinct emotional and consciousness, and a, 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 a person that has a distinct being to them, but with the same divine nature. No attribute is more or less essential to God in any of the persons of the Trinity. So, uh, so we've got, we've got distinct centers of consciousness. We've got distinct abilities to relate. We've got, that's why we use the word persons. It's the word that communicates this distinct identity, but then we immediately say with the same divine nature. Um, you know, every analogy runs out really fast, but you and I have the same human nature. But we're different persons. There's a distinction there. Now, don't run long with this. It runs out immediately. But, but we recognize the distinction in person with a oneness of nature. And so it, it shouldn't surprise us that human beings made in God's image are like this. We're distinct and unified in, in a similar kind of way that the Trinity is distinct and unified. Yes? I understand. That. It's just my mind just it can't. It, Good. You know what I mean? Good. That means you're really thinking. I get what you're saying. Like, yeah. I believe it, but you can't. It's like... Of course not. So, yeah. yeah. So, so congratulate yourself that you're really thinking and you're really thinking about God. And bring your broom to your cohort meeting when you talk about this to yeah. sweep up the pieces of your brain. Yes. If you don't feel like your brain's exploding, you're not really thinking about this stuff. So it's good. It's a really good sign that your head hurts right now. All right. I just, one more. I, I, yeah, it, it is hard to imagine, isn't it? Because what we're talking about here is three persons who equally share omniscience. Not one of them lacks any information, any knowledge. Not one of them lacks any wisdom. Not one of them lacks any power or compassion or mercy or justice or holiness or truth. So they share all these same attributes and so they're perfectly unified in their will. Now when we get to Christ it's going to be fascinating because a human will there's some disagreement in the church on this, but a human will has entered into this, which is why he even has the ability in the garden to say, not my will, but thy will be done. It's all right, good, because that, that's another one that's just like... Yeah, we're going there. Okay. <laughs> we're going there. We'll go there the last third of the semester. Great questions. Let's keep going uh, and, and make this last point. The unity and diversity of the Godhead provides us with the model for relationships within the body of Christ. So when we act in godly ways, we become like God in, in some part in this unity and distinction. I, I just used the illustration of Marcelo and I having the same human nature, equally human. There's not anything true of a human that isn't equally true of both of us, yet we're, we're unique and distinct at the same time. Well, human relationships are supposed to be a reflection, a model of this truth of God. 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are varieties of gifts, 
but the same spirit. So we're different in the way we're gifted, in the way we function, in the way we relate. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. And so we have a distinct and unified body of Christ. Ephesians 4, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So distinction and unity within the body of Christ, this ultimate reflection of who God is. And then marriage. We're aware that marriage is intended to be a reflection of the relationship between Christ and his church, but it's also intended to be a reflection of the relations within the Trinity itself. 1 Corinthians 11, 3, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So there's something in human marriage that's supposed to reflect this un unified and distinct way of relating. So do you see what we lose if we lose the Trinity? Everything, revelation, redemption, God's being as an independent and relational being for all of eternity and our primary model for human relations in the body of Christ and in marriage. A whole lot's at stake. You know, I have a friend who applied for a pastor at a big church and, uh, years ago, and he went to the interview for this. And the first question, what do you think of our doctrinal statement? And he says, well, I agree with the whole thing. I think it's well written, except for one sentence, he said. He said, you have this sentence when it, talks in, when it says that Jesus Christ is the revelation of God the Father in the flesh. And he said, no, he isn't. He's the revelation of what? God the Son in the flesh. The way you say that is modalism, Jerry said. It's abelianism. It was actually condemned as heresy in the fourth century. So I got a problem with that statement. And so... Um, they said, wow, nobody's ever pointed it out before. We certainly see what you're saying, but you need to know we can't make any changes in our doctrinal statement, so um, it's got to stay because our Constitution requires we can't change and we have to disband as a church, scrap our Constitution, start over again, and oh, we can't do that. Second question, have you ever drank alcohol? Jerry said, well, I don't consider myself a drinker, but on Christmas, you know, if I'm in England in a pub, I'll have something, but I'm happy to submit to a Christian organization that thinks it's wise for its leaders to refrain. And they said, well, I'm sorry to say that not only can you not drink as a pastor of our church, you can't come to that decision because we want you to. You had to come to it on your own. So it's basically end of interview. So Jerry, you know, on the way out, they said, you know, how are you feeling, Jerry? What do you think? He said, well, that second question really helps you weed people out quickly. And they said, well, what do you think of it all? And he said, well, I really think it's amazing that because of the political implications, you're willing to tolerate Trinitarian heresy in your doctrinal statement. But you've got a rule for your pastors that would make it impossible for guys like Jesus and Paul to be pastors here. Look, I'm not saying, yay, alcohol. What I am saying is, let's get things in perspective. What really matters here? Does the Trinity matter? You better believe it does. We need to care about these things and pay attention to them. But when um, one of the disciples asked Jesus to show them the Father, mm. he says, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. Yes, you even asking? yes, so, good, good. And that is just the kind of passage that a modalist, that a one is Pentecostal, will camp on at the exclusion of ones where there are clear distinctions. And so when we make an overall overarching systematic theology statement, we don't just leave the door open to be modalists by camping on a path. Because there are passages that if that's all you had, we'd be modalists. There are other passages that if it's all you had, we'd be tritheists. But when we do good systematic theology, we don't make statements that are, are defining statements that leave the door wide open, that sound modalistic, left to themselves, for sure. And so, and so, so yeah, depending on which passages we, we focus on, you could come up with all kinds of teaching. That's why this theological 
method that we're trying to do where we get back and say, no, we need to consider all of the relevant passages to this question and therefore uh, walk this tension between modalism and tritheism. Yes? Okay. Um, all right. Arguments for the existence of God in four minutes. You ready? <laughs> Arguments for the existence of God come from general revelation, not special revelation, which is why we don't really include it as the beginning point of our study of God. We, we try to go the way the Bible goes, and that's starting with God's revelation of himself. Now, that doesn't mean he's not revealing himself in general revelation, but... Uh, we camp on the Bible. But it's so helpful, though, to think about, well, how do we see the teachings of the Bible supported in our experience? Generally, even apart from the Bible, how do we uh, understand the reality of God when we just look around ourselves and in ourselves? And that's external general, general revelation is looking around ourselves. Internal is looking within ourselves. And so let's consider some of these arguments. Two from external general revelation. The cosmological argument looks at the world and says, we don't know anything that exists apart from a sufficient cause. So how do you explain the existence of the world apart from a sufficient cause for its existence? It certainly doesn't act eternal. It acts anything but. And actually science, in many ways, is based on the assumption that the world uh, exhibits things like the law of second, thermo, uh, second law of thermodynamics, that everything's wearing down, which indicates a beginning point. Self-creation really is an inherent, irrational, illogical assertion. And so it must have been caused by something bigger than itself and ex external to itself and eternal then. The teleological argument takes this a step further and says not only is the world obviously caused, it's obviously intelligently caused. Think about an eye the human body, the ecosystem, the solar system, the world is profoundly intelligently caused. And even people who deny that tend to talk as if everything were caused with intention. This idea of telos, this teleological argument, telos, is the goal of everything. And you can't have goals if there's no intention in creation. But even atheists say things like, oh man, I need my hip replaced because my hip is not working the way it's supposed to. You don't get to have supposed to's if you don't have divine intention. And so we recognize a divinely, intelligently designed world. What about when we look inside the human experience? Arguments from internal general revelation. The argument from personality says, how do you get an aurora, a person with mind, volition, will, sense of humor, creativity, relational ability from an impersonal mechanistic random system? Do you ever get the more complex from the less complex? Do you ever get the personal from the impersonal? Isn't it the other way around? And so the argument goes, the impersonal plus all the time you want and all the chance you want can never yield the personal. The argument from beauty and the love of beauty or aesthetic says every human being, every human culture has had a conception of beauty, an appreciation for the beautiful. Where does that come from apart from a divine artist who is the source of beauty and gives us all invariably the understanding of it and appreciation of it? It may differ from culture to culture and person to person, but we all get this idea of something that is aesthetically pleasing in and of itself, even though it doesn't help us climb the food chain. Argument for morality. Everybody believes in right and wrong. It gets suppressed and distorted and perverted, but everybody universally has a sense of right and wrong, and no one who claims to be a moral relativist lives that way. If someone says that truth is relative and we just make it up, punch them in the face and see how indignant they get. And when you say, well, me and my friends have decided that that's okay to do, they won't agree with you. They'll be indignant and want you arrested. Um, because nobody really lives as moral relativists because we all have a sense of right and wrong. Where does that come from? Apart from a divine lawgiver, a moral judge who instills in us a sense of truth and righteousness and goodness and what evil is. 
The argument for meaning and significance says every human being has a deep desire to know their life matters. It's significant. It, it accounts for something beyond this world. And where does that come from apart from a God who made you to count beyond this world and gave you a deep desire for that to be true? And finally, the argument from religious experience. Human beings are incurably religious, it's been said, and every human culture that's ever existed has been predominantly religious. And atheism, you need to realize, is a profoundly a minority view. Atheism is primarily the invention of white Western urban men. Poor people don't come up with atheism. People who have a sense of their dependence don't come up with atheism. And where does that come from apart from a God who created us to worship Him, to be accountable to Him, and instilled in all of us a recognition of that? I love you guys. See ya. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.